A typewritten note lies next to a dead man. A document examiner must read between the lines to lead authorities to the killer. A murderer writes, then destroys the story of his crime. Investigators will do everything to assure the tale ends with a conviction. And a to-do list scrawled on an ordinary piece of cardboard includes an extraordinary task. Detectives look to handwriting to prove a murder was premeditated. Among today's new detectives are the forensic document examiners. Under their keen eye, a scrap of paper or a typewriter ribbon can be as incriminating as a confession signed in blood. Hello Cruel Cruel World, my name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and a speaker at CrimeCon this year, 10th of 11th of June in London. It's gonna be awesome, you have to get there. Law enforcement professionals, symposiums, workshops, everything to do with true crime. Go copy your tickets at crimecon.co.uk and use the code REALCRIME for a 10% discount. See you there. Minnesota, February 6, 1995. Police officers responded to a 911 call. They arrived at the home of Ted Mills, his wife, Mamie Hernandez Mills, and stepson, Nathan Latou. Mamie and Nathan had come home from a dental appointment to find Ted Mills dead and the house ransacked. Mills lay with a shotgun wound in his head. The back door of the house showed signs of forced entry. The strewn clothing seemed to indicate a robbery had taken place. Three twenty eight dispatcher. Supervisor respond. Then police found a note. If somebody's been through this dresser. Typed on a torn sheet of lined yellow note paper, it read, this is for our bud that you sent to jail. Rest in peace. It was one clue that would speak volumes, not just in the words on the page, but in its paper and ink. Sergeant David Palmer of the Minneapolis Homicide Unit relied on the expertise of forensic document examiner Karen Runyon to help him read between the lines. Document examiners match writers with their penmanship, typists with their typewriters, counterfeiters with their forgeries. Using computers, microscopes, and digital enhancement, these new detectives delve into the minuscule world of paper fibers and carbon particles to solve crimes. As the document examiner in this case, it was up to Runyon to learn all she could from the slip of paper. The note was collected by the crime scene people and brought to me, and I first made an examination to determine how the note had been prepared, and it had been prepared with a typewriter that used a carbon film ribbon, which told me that if the ribbon could be located, the ribbon could be read and matched possibly to this entry. Runyon told officers to look for an electric typewriter with a carbon film ribbon, and if they found one like that, they should collect it as evidence. 
as well. They should be aware that this document had a fractured lower edge to it where it's been torn off of the rest of the piece of paper. And they should look for any pieces of um, paper like this with any fractured edge or any type of tablet that this might have been torn out of. While Runyon focused on the note, the police questioned the victim's wife and stepson. According to Mamie and Nathan, they were at a dental appointment when the murder occurred. They phoned home from the dentist's office, but no one answered. Ted should have been home, but they assumed he was sound asleep, since he worked nights and slept days. The note suggested the murder and burglary were a payback for a past burglary at their home that was foiled by the victim. Mills had helped send the burglar to jail. Sergeant Palmer initially believed the story, but the seeds of doubt were already sprouting. Well, there was some uh, truth to this, and we couldn't discount this. But at the same time, our experience tells us that generally burglars are not going to return or have somebody return and kill somebody because of an identification that they have made. During questioning, which police videotaped, Nathan Latou told police he saw a handgun next to Mills' body, but police couldn't find it. They were skeptical. Certain details didn't match Latou's story. They have two dogs in the house that bark whenever strangers come, and yet Ted Mills is sleeping upstairs and never woke up. To Palmer, that suggested the culprit wasn't a stranger. But Mamie and Nathan's alibis had support. A caller ID unit at the house registered their call from the dentist's office around the time of the murder. Another detail nagged at Palmer. The place seemed ransacked in too orderly a manner, not the way a burglar would generally tear up a room. We were suspicious about this because our experience as investigators, most burglars are not this neat as we found contents pulled out so they could be put readily and easily back into the drawers that they were dumped. And Latou's 911 call to police raised further suspicion. Yes, my father's been shot. What happened? We just got home. I was at the VA hospital with my mom. They broke in the back door. Trashed upstairs, they shot him. <laughs> he just had too much knowledge that he was able to tell us immediately. Most people, when you talk to them in a, in they're in a hysterical state like this, they can't hardly tell you what time of the day it is. All they can do is screaming and crying and, and get somebody out there to help us. But this was, this was a different thing. We had an uneasy feeling about this. Something about the case didn't ring true. The pieces just didn't fit. The strongest indication that all was not as it seemed was a fingerprint on a broken window at the point of entry. It belonged to Nathan Latou. When Nathan Latou was confronted with the fingerprint evidence, he broke down and admitted his involvement in the murder. Days before the killing, Latou said his mother asked him to write out, in longhand, the phrases typed on the note found next to Mills. Now, investigators had reason to believe that Mamie Hernandez Mills typed the note herself. But how? She said she couldn't read or write English, and there was no typewriter in the house. Police needed to find the typewriter used to create the note. Now that Nathan had implicated Mamie, Runyon and investigators began to focus their search. They remembered that Hernandez Mills cleaned houses for a living. Police decided to look for a typewriter in the last few homes she worked in. In one of them, police found an electric typewriter with a carbon film ribbon.
the last few words of the note were clearly visible. They also found several yellow notepads with paper similar to the note. The ribbon was brought to Karen Runyon's lab for analysis. She was relieved to find the film cartridge had been left in the typewriter. If the ribbon had been used up and discarded, the case would have become even more complicated. To confirm the ribbon contained the full text of the note, she carefully pried open the cartridge. I took the ribbon cartridge apart, and then I transcribed the ribbon itself, working from the final entry, which we could see on the ribbon as we took it out of the typewriter. I worked backwards from there, transcribing everything that was typed on that ribbon. Runyon discovered the note had been typed three times. It proved that whoever typed it knew little about how to use the typewriter. The first two times it was typed, there were spelling errors, and the typist must not have realized that there was a correcting device on the machine. And so they must have started over. Runyon compared fibers that had been transferred from the paper onto the ribbon. When the carbon is knocked off the ribbon onto the document, paper fibers adhere to that mylar strip that the carbon is on in the ribbon cartridge, and the paper fibers stay on the ribbon itself. By matching the fibers adhering to the ribbon with the fibers on the note, Runyon concluded that the note was indeed typed using this ribbon. You match the fibers almost like a fingerprint. The fibers are in a random pattern, and they've adhered to this ribbon in that same random pattern that they were on the paper itself. With Karen Runyon's help, the sordid story inside the plastic casing began to unravel. Within the typewriter ribbon cassette lay the true story of what happened to Ted Mills. The clues were microscopic, but their significance was great. In this case, I was able to match all the fibers in each of the letters on this note. Karen Runyon had linked the note to the typewriter, and police linked the typewriter to Mamie Hernandez Mills. But the full story still needed to be told. Sergeant Palmer had to determine Mamie's role in the crime and a motive for committing it. He continued to coax more details from Nathan Latou. He said that his mother uh, had uh, got the shotgun that belonged to her husband up from the closet upstairs and had gone over and had shot her husband while he was laying in the bed, sleeping. He, in fact, said that he went and got the shotgun that was used in the murder, took it down and concealed it in a room downstairs in the basement that was next to where he slept. Nathan eventually tells myself and my partner, Sergeant Krebs, what we wanted to know, that he and his mother were responsible for the death of Ted Mills. Nathan Latou swore, however, that he didn't pull the trigger. By the same token, as he implicated his mother, he was also gravely concerned about her fate. He's very uh, worried about what's going to happen to his mother. More so than himself, he's very worried and very protective of his mother. Throughout this whole thing, is, he keeps admonishing us not to hurt his mother, not to do anything to his mother. Mamie Hernandez Mills maintained her cool and her innocence. When she's talking to us, she's very cooperative with us. I mean, she gives you the appearance to ask me anything, I'll tell you anything. But obviously, except for that one thing, she will never, even in this interview, admit that she had anything to do with the death of Ted Mills. As the pressure of the interrogation began to build, Mamie turned against her son, just as Nathan had turned against her. She told police Nathan had raped her at gunpoint. Hearing this lie, Nathan Latou broke down again. He had been withholding his greatest secret of all. He and his mother had been having an incestuous relationship. 41-year-old Mamie Hernandez Mills had only recently reunited with 22-year-old Nathan Latou, 
whom she gave up for adoption years earlier. Now, Mamie was exerting a profound influence on her son. The police used that influence as leverage to obtain a confession from Latou. We're kind of using, we're saying, Mamie, your mother kind of pushed you to doing this because she's the very strong, controlling person in this relationship that they have. Mother is controlling son. Finally, Latou agreed to testify against his mother in return for a reduced charge of second-degree murder. At about the same time, investigators discovered that Mills had a life insurance policy through work and that Mamie had called to claim it shortly after his death. With this motive now exposed, the shuffled events of that bloody February day fell into place. Mamie Hernandez Mills had typed the note on her employer's typewriter, using Nathan's handwritten note as her guide. Each time she made a mistake, she started over, leaving behind a telltale story inside the typewriter cartridge. Each keystroke pulled fibers from the paper, transferring them to the mylar strip on the ribbon. Nathan Latou faked a break-in at their home. He made it look just as a burglar had months before, but he left behind an incriminating fingerprint. As Nathan and Mamie climbed the stairs, they were careful not to wake Ted Mills. Upon entering the bedroom, they wasted no time. After killing Mills, the two faked the burglary. Mamie left a note meant to steer investigators toward an avenging intruder who never existed. Then, mother and son went to the hospital to keep a dental appointment. Um, can we use your phone, please? Mm -hmm. While there, they used a phone to check in at home knowing their call would be registered by the caller ID unit. This call was the basis for their alibi. When they arrived back home, Nathan placed the 911 call to police. He later told investigators he'd hidden the murder weapon in a pipe and buried it beneath a tree. In court, he testified against his mother in exchange for a reduced sentence. Mamie Hernandez Mills was convicted of first-degree murder on April 20th, 1996. She is serving a life sentence. Nathan Latou pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 24 years. By leaving a note, Mamie Hernandez Mills and Nathan Latou meant to cast blame on a fictional intruder, but they left too much real-world evidence to the contrary. The note was left next to the body and that the note was part of a scheme to make this look like another type of crime than what it really was. And in that perspective, this was an interesting case and the fact that we did find the machine with the ribbon for investigators Palmer and Runyon, a note meant to throw authorities off track led them right to the killer. In Virginia, a murder case was even more ironic. In a scrawled note to himself, a man made his deadly intentions terribly clear. The shooting death of an elderly woman in February 1995 brought police to a home in eastern Virginia. The only thing missing from the scene was $5 taken from the woman's purse. Police knew the crime was committed by 18-year-old Richard Webb, live-in grandson of the victim. According to police, Richard planned to kill his grandparents, steal their money, and take their van. The grandfather escaped when the gun malfunctioned. 
Unable to find keys to the van, Richard Webb fled on foot and was apprehended a short time later. Webb was guilty, but his guilt was a matter of degree. If police were right and Richard planned the killing with intent to rob, he'd be guilty of first-degree murder. But if he killed on a sudden, violent impulse, he'd probably receive a lesser charge. It was up to the police to determine the killer's intentions. While searching Richard's bedroom, police found an important clue in a torn piece of cardboard. On it was written a to-do list. Among such mundane items as play pool and watch movie was item number eight. It stated simply, kill. After that was get money and leave. The list seemed strong evidence that Webb had planned his crimes. It was turned over to Michael Moore, document examiner at Virginia's Division of Forensic Science in Richmond. In order to prove that Webb wrote the note, he'd need to look for similarities between the handwriting on the note and samples known to have been written by Webb. The handwriting identification is, is based on the premise uh, that handwriting embodies uh, certain qualities and features which are sufficiently personal uh, to serve as the basis for an identification of the writer. Webb's murderous list, now classified as evidence, was securely sealed and delivered to Michael Moore. Our handwriting is as personal as our fingerprints. As youngsters, most of us were taught to write by imitating a standard system, often referred to as a copybook system. In spite of this standardized technique, we begin to develop our own personal handwriting that stays with us for life. These deviations provide the basis for analysis. When examining a document, Moore looks at speed, skill, slant and height ratio, proportion, and the overall appearance of the writing. Similarities as well as differences are scrutinized. Consistent combinations of features are what Moore seeks to identify. Does it exhibit good line quality? Uh, are there some unusual stopping and starting places? Does it have uh, patching or retouching? Are there blunt beginning and ending strokes? He set to work, applying a three-step process to the handwriting examination. He knew from the start this was to be a challenging assignment. In the first phase, he was concerned strictly with the writing surface. Moore noted that something had been torn from the face of the smooth cardboard, exposing rough inner layers. Any handwriting on these layers might be distorted by the rough surface. Portions of this particular piece of cardboard being so rough uh, were difficult to write on and there was some overwriting. Um, you know, meaning that the person that did the writing had to actually write over several times in order to, to get a visible image. Glue adhering to the cardboard interfered with the movement of the pen. Moore had to factor that into his analysis. Some of the uh, uh, unusual or blunt, uh, awkward movements, for example, where the where the ink or the pen came into contact uh, with the foreign matter, with the adhesive. Is this the habit of the writer to square off this particular portion of this letter, or is this as a result of coming in contact with this amount of glue? The first phase of the examination showed that the rough edges, as well as the glue, may have affected the shape of the letters. In item number two, the bottom of the W in work is squared off where the pen hit the glue. If the writing sample contains letters with closed loops, the document examiner must determine whether they are the habit of the person who wrote the sample or if they were created by the water-based ink bleeding and closing the loop. 
These variations in the writing surface can cause the letters to deviate from the author's normal handwriting, making it difficult to analyze. Richard, how you doing? In the second phase of examination, Moore studied the known material or handwriting known to have come from the suspect. Again, he faced a challenge. In custody, Webb was asked to fill out forms, take dictation on a piece of cardboard, and produce other writing to compare with the original list. Watch movie. Go to town. Moore made the comparison, but he found the samples inadequate. Webb penned the dictated writings in a very formal, controlled environment. Kill. The original list was undoubtedly written under very different conditions. The two sets of writing only vaguely resembled each other. Moore was able to say he had some reason to believe that Webb had written the list, but he couldn't be absolutely certain. To make a more conclusive judgment, he needed to see more of Webb's writings. No two writings from any one person, even if they were done by the same person, will ever be exactly alike, meaning that they'll superimpose. It can't happen. People are not machines. He asked the detective for additional writings from Webb, because factors such as body position and writing surfaces affect handwriting. He requested the samples come from a variety of circumstances. I wanted to talk to you. The type of medium that was written on, uh, you know, one would expect that it was probably not done at a table or at a desk. It, it could have been standing up, it, uh, unsupported, and it could have been holding a piece of cardboard in his hand. Just no way to know. The sheriff's deputies gathered an assortment of Webb's writing, including personal letters, cards, and some of his poetry. Webb had written these samples over a period of time, so they showed a wider range of his handwriting styles. Now came Moore's biggest challenge, the final phase of the handwriting examination, where he'd make the critical side-by-side -side comparison of the list and Webb's previously written material. For presentation in court, he used a black and white enlargement of the list. The features and characteristics used to identify handwriting take many forms. Some are conspicuous, some are subtle. On the cardboard list, Moore noted that the relative size of numerals to capital letters was consistent. The number one was taller than the capital C in call. The number two was also taller than the capital W in work. Moore found this same habit reflected in the known writings of Richard Webb. The significance of Webb's natural range of variation raised a problem for Moore. He had to account for Webb's tendency to form the letter R slightly differently each time he wrote it. In item number one, the letter began well to the left of the spine, then continued on to form a rounded upper portion. In item nine, that capital R still began to the left of the spine, but the top portion was flat. Moore recognized the same variations of the letter R on Webb's known writings. They matched exactly the variations found on the cardboard list. The combination of these features led Moore to a single conclusion. He could state with virtual certainty that Richard Webb was the person who wrote the list on the cardboard and had therefore premeditated his crimes. Ultimately, it takes a human mind to recognize a human hand. While computers are helping to solve more crimes every day, Michael Moore feels his job is secure. While computers are, are useful in some areas of, of forensic document examination, they really just are not applicable to comparative handwriting uh, by the mere fact that they have no way of, of, first of all, gauging the relative individuality of the question signature. 
Even if 20 variations of a signature were scanned into a computer, it might still fail to identify a 21st signature as coming from that same writer. Computers do not have the ability to judge the range of variation or the circumstances under which the writing was produced. Computers are just not, not in today's, what's available in today's market, are just not, not capable of, of doing what, what the human can do. When confronted with Moore's findings, Richard Webb pleaded guilty and received a life sentence for capital murder. Ultimately, handwriting analysis matched the killer to his crime. But when comparing handwriting, the analyst must always be certain he's focusing on the right clues. The most crucial writing samples may come from the least likely sources. One handwriting expert's small lapse in judgment fueled the flames of one of the greatest hoaxes in modern history. In April 1983, the world was riveted by the news that Adolf Hitler's diaries had been discovered in Stuttgart. The 60 handwritten volumes, written over 35 years, were found by a German journalist. To determine if the books were truly written in Hitler's hand, the German government enlisted a brigade of specialists, including handwriting analyst Ordway Hilton. Hilton was given seven samples of Hitler's writing to compare to the diaries. Based on these samples, he declared the diaries authentic. It was an honest mistake that almost destroyed his reputation. Hilton was duped. He correctly determined that the author of the diaries also wrote the samples he used to compare them with. But his fatal flaw was his assumption that Hitler wrote the samples. He didn't. They were written by the same person who forged the diaries. That man was Conrad Cougeot. The diaries were sold for more than two million dollars before the fraud was exposed by an international team of document examiners, chemists, and historians. By studying the composition of the paper, the quality of the type, and other characteristics, they determined the diaries were no more than four years old. When the West German State Archives announced their findings, they discredited the books in no uncertain terms, declaring the diaries the grotesquely superficial concoction of a copyist endowed with a limited intellectual capacity. Even so, Cougeot perpetrated the most expensive fraud in the history of publishing. If it weren't for the expertise of forensic examiners, he might have pulled it off. But incriminating documents seem to have a way of ending up in the right hands especially if the crime is murder. In Smyrna, Tennessee, outside of Nashville, a man made a poignant televised appeal for help in 1994. Ricky Bryan, a 39-year-old welder, had a sporadic five-year relationship with 72-year-old Charlotte Scott. I did date the woman for a little over six years. And She's missing, so we gotta find her. And he just come Scott had been missing for two weeks. I wish she'd come back home, wherever she's at. I she went the family the was hopeful she would be found. I have to pray that something, someone comes forward. Scott's daughter, Rosalie, reported her missing after finding her gone and her apartment door left open. We just would like to know where, where she is. Police department, anybody home? Police searched Scott's home on October 19th. She was last seen filling a prescription and going to a money machine. Her car was parked outside her apartment. Back door is still open. You want to check upstairs? There were no indications of forced entry. All the signs of a daily routine were still intact, as if she would be returning shortly. 
With no clues to be found in the house, police turned to Ricky Bryan. They hoped he could provide some information. At first, it didn't seem Brian could help them. He said he was out of town when Scott disappeared and claimed they hadn't spoken in three months. But Brian helped police more than he imagined. Detectives E.J. Bernard of the Metro Nashville Police and Clayton Thomas of the Smyrna Police found a hole in Brian's story, a hole they hoped to climb through to get to the truth. They discovered Brian had used Scott's ATM card the day she was reported missing. Detective Bernard. He told us he wasn't in Nashville, but we had proof of this through the camera, statements from his relatives, as well as the transactions from the bank, which was very close to her residence. With that proof, Brian's alibi crumbled. But just because he took Scott's money didn't mean he was involved in her disappearance. Even so, the lie made him the only suspect in this crime of few clues. After he failed a polygraph test, police obtained a warrant to search his home. They were looking for ATM receipts, weapons, tools that might be used in a kidnapping or a murder, anything that could link Brian to the crime. They found nothing. They had no physical evidence and no more leads. The investigation ground to a halt. A few frustrating days passed before detectives received a break. Some of Brian's family members stepped forward. They told police he had divulged an outrageous story. According to Ricky Bryan, Charlotte Scott was murdered by a gang of drunken men at a rock quarry where the couple frequently met. Ricky had left for a few minutes, and when he returned, Charlotte had been killed. He knew the story sounded absurd, and he had no witnesses to prove he wasn't involved. So he decided to bury the body and deny he knew what happened to her. In one respect, police agreed with him. The story was absurd. But why would he concoct such a tale unless he really did bury Charlotte Scott? If the strange tale was his way of deflecting guilt from himself, it had the opposite effect. Police now had reason to suspect Charlotte Scott was murdered and that Ricky Bryan killed her, but they still had not a shred of evidence. When police confronted him about the story, he denied he ever told it. Even so, the story was the only lead they had. They began searching for the buried body. Despite their long hours and the use of cadaver dogs, they turned up nothing. Then, Michael Thompson, Ricky Bryan's nephew, approached Detective Thomas and offered his help. The 19-year-old would soon lead investigators to a spot in the woods and Ricky Bryan to a point of no return. Investigators rely on skill, wit, and luck to find breaks in criminal cases. In the murder investigation of Charlotte Scott, the break stepped forward in the form of Michael Thompson, nephew of Ricky Bryan. Thompson volunteered to speak with Bryan and hopefully learn the whereabouts of the victim's body. Police told Michael Thompson they'd appreciate him sharing any information he might find out. On November 15, 1994, Thompson went to visit his uncle. Brian was extremely suspicious. He was convinced his house was bugged and that police were watching his every move. After searching his nephew for a listening device, 
Brian and Thompson engaged in a stilted dialogue meant to mask the true thrust of the conversation. Brian needed to recover a shovel and rake he buried in the woods with Scott's body. Here was his confession, but he wasn't about to say it out loud. Instead, he wrote it in a notebook. Each time he wrote a message, he ripped the paper from the notebook and burned it in a wood stove. He was afraid if they were found, the tools would link him to the body. And during the written communication, Brian sketched a detailed map pinpointing where the tools and the body were buried. Then he burned the map, just as he had burned the other notes. That evidence was gone. But not for long. After leaving Brian's home, Michael Thompson immediately called police. Following the directions he'd memorized from the map drawn by his uncle, he led them to a pit in the woods. There, they found a body. 327 T Sarge. Uh, definitely her. 327 T Sarge. There was an odor of uh, decomposed flesh. We then started going through the items. There was a lot of debris. We pulled debris out. And at one point, Detective Thomas found the, um, the foot belonging to the victim. The remains were crushed and mutilated almost beyond recognition. With the help of an identification unit, Detectives Thomas and Bernard recovered and identified the body of Charlotte Scott. Nearly a month had passed since she had last been seen. The case had stalled for several weeks as investigators tried in vain to trip up Ricky Bryan. But now they could go forward. Charlotte Scott had been found. And Ricky Bryan's weird story about burying her body had led to her discovery. Police had what they needed to arrest Ricky Bryan, but not enough to convict him. They needed hard evidence that proved Bryan knew where the body was buried. The testimony of his nephew may not have been enough to convince a jury. They needed the notebook in which he drew the map. The map itself was unrecoverable, but if the notebook could be found, perhaps the remaining pages would bear its faint impression, proving Brian had total knowledge of the slaying. Once again, Brian's family helped police by bringing Detective Thomas the clue he sought. In December, the brother of Ricky Bryan was cleaning up the house uh, that Ricky Bryan resided in and came across a notebook. The notebook was then immediately brought to me. Uh, upon looking at the notebook, I could see impressions of where something had been written on. The vague impressions defied all efforts to read them. But Thomas was convinced they could be turned into hard evidence if only they could be made legible. For that, he depended on the forensic laboratory of the U.S. Postal Service in Memphis, Tennessee. Examining more than 17,000 documents each year, it's one of the busiest document evaluation centers in the United States. The lab is equipped to analyze anything having to do with ink and paper. They can regain writing that's been erased and even illuminate signatures that have been scribbled out. An infrared light source called a crime scope makes some inks invisible and others fluoresce disclosing hidden writing. The lab usually examines documents relating to white collar crimes, credit card thefts, forgeries, and fraud. It occasionally assists with outside criminal investigations, especially in cases of murder. Forensic document analyst Grant Sperry has been with the lab for 18 years. 
Postal Service normally does not get involved in local police cases. Our primary responsibility is to assist or support postal inspectors in the investigation of their offenses by providing them with forensic expertise in the area of fingerprints or document examination. However, uh, in certain cases, uh, such as this one where a heinous crime has been committed, well, we will offer our assistance. Grant, what I have here is a, uh, a notebook. In November of 1994, Detective Thomas brought forensic document analyst Grant Sperry the notebook from Ricky Bryan's house. The original map was... Uh, if these seemingly blank pages could be coaxed into revealing their secrets, Thomas would have the evidence he needed to convict a killer. We can conduct. He would depend on Sperry and the postal laboratory to decipher the faint impressions of writing left on the page. These telltale furrows are called indented writing. They're embossed on a blank page when the page above is written on. Would the ghostly impressions in the notebook tell the story of Charlotte Scott's murder? Would they be enough to convict Ricky Bryan? Okay, Patricia, we need to uh, photograph. Using a fiber optic light source to illuminate the surface of the paper, Sperry determined that Bryan's notebook did indeed contain faint impressions of the map and other indented writings. After photographing it, he utilized the electrostatic detection apparatus, or ESDA. The ESDA would make the ghost-like indentations visible. The beauty of the ESDA is that it's non-destructive for the most part. In other words, your document is protected by the uh, film, the imaging film. You can retain a permanent record of any of your indentations that are developed. Sperry placed the page from the notebook on a brass plate and pulled plastic film over it. Then a vacuum drew the film into the paper fibers and into the impressions. The film was then electrically charged while toner cascaded over it. The toner was attracted by the charge and filled the indentations in the film. Once the toner settled into place, Sperry secured it with a sheet of adhesive-backed plastic. Next step is to press, take the clear plastic adhesive, which now has an image on it developed with our ESDA, and cut this image down to size, removing the excess plastic. Before lifting the plastic film, Sperry smoothed it to remove air bubbles. It's not uncommon. A single document might go through the ESDA process five to ten times to bring out every nuance. See here we have uh, entries that appear to be school uh, inside of a... If necessary, the lift can be scanned into a computer to enhance and separate the image. In this case, the lift of the map was so bold that Sperry could read the indented writings with a magnifying glass. Thomas and Sperry were pleased with the quality of the lift and with the number of writing samples that emerged. ESDA disclosed every detail of the carefully drawn map, leading no doubt as to where it led. An arrow drawn to this little circled area, does that mean anything? Yes. This is going to be Industrial Boulevard. The roadway will be a uh, the pit. The pit? That the body was located it in. It was, okay. Additionally, you have the words shovel and rake alongside yes. that. Yes. On his map, yes. Brian used specific and, uh, detail to describe him, where he buried his victim. His clear, this was the evidence detectives were looking for. Uh, under rock. What, what this is, Once he had a clear image of the map, Sperry compared the writing to known samples of Ricky Bryan's writing. Well, in this particular case, not only was it important to have the uh, details of the map, as they ultimately were revealed through this examination, but because we had writing available to examine, uh, obviously since the details of this map are precisely and, and pinpoint precisely where the body was located, the author of the map 
uh, one would think, would have absolute knowledge of where that body was. So it became important to determine exactly who did, in fact, write it. More for the writing samples on the map matched known samples of Ricky Bryan's handwriting. Sperry had proved that Ricky Bryan was the author of the map. Once all the evidence was revealed, Detective Bernard pieced together a likely scenario of Bryan's crime. He went to her house late one night, took her from the house, brought her to this isolated area here, killed her, mutilated her, and then buried her in a grave. What led Ricky Bryan to brutally murder the woman he claimed to love? Some said it was for her money. Clayton Thomas feels differently. I think he was really in love with her. Um, I feel that, uh, uh, that during this time, uh, she was uh, breaking off the relationship. And I felt that if he couldn't have her, no one else could have her as well. Ricky Bryan never admitted killing Charlotte Scott. To the end, he clung to his story about the mysterious gang of men. He was charged with first degree murder and sentenced to 25 years before he'd be eligible for parole. When a killer leaves behind a paper trail, little does he know that he may have already signed his confession. Every document tells two stories one is intended by the writer, and anyone can read it. But the other is a secret tale that sometimes hides a terrible truth. Document examiners are the tellers of these tales, who seek the indelible truth behind the paper and ink.